Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. Welcome back to another episode of Luthier Quick Tips. If you've been watching my channel for the past year or so, when I'm down in my basement where I do all my setup work, you've probably noticed I have a couple of guitars that are hanging up behind me, and it's the same two guitars. Now I know some of you are wondering, what's the story behind those guitars? Are those custom builds? Are they spec builds that I'm gonna be putting up for sale when they're finished? How long does it take me to build a guitar? Well, the story behind those is they're both spec guitars. And I started them a while back with the intention of building them in my spare time. And then once they're finished, I was gonna put them up for sale. However, I ended up getting really busy. And as a result, I kind of put those guitars on hold for a while. They just weren't a priority. But what I did do is I used the guitars to test out some finish ideas and some different products that uh, I had discovered. And I finally have reached a point where I was looking at the guitars the other day, this one in particular, which is my Bravo single cutaway design. And I decided, you know, this is a really nice looking guitar. Let's, let's finish it. So what I did was I sanded all the test finish off the surface, went all the way back to the uh, raw wood. Then I sanded the surface smooth with 220 grit sandpaper. Next, I masked off the top and on the back I sprayed some crystal lac sanding sealer. And the reason I did that is because I want to use the sanding sealer as sort of a pre-staining wood conditioner. What it does is it, is it helps the dye stains that I intend to apply absorb more evenly into the wood. So I sprayed that finish and then I removed the masking. And once that sanding sealer had dried, I sanded it back down leaving it just in the pores and grain, as especially the open grain around the sides of the guitar. Once that was done, I mixed up some amber gold dye stain, and I did this using trans tint. Uh, I used yellow and a tiny bit of red mixed into some Crystal Lac Bright Tone to act as a binder and then a bunch of water. And I don't remember exactly what the ratios were. I tend to experiment and test on scrap until I get the color in, uh, intensity that I want for the project that I'm doing. Once I had that uh, adjusted to where I wanted it, I applied that color over the entire body of the guitar, the top as well as the sides and back. And then I let that dry. Then I went back and I carefully applied a more of a kind of a blood red color, a transparent blood red color, again, using the trans tint dyes with some Crystal Lac Bright Tone and, and water. And I applied that just to the mahogany, to the back and the edges, the sides, and kind of where it, it meets up with the top here. And I just freehanded it. Then when I was done, I scraped off some of the color around this edge to kind of create just a faux binding look. And it, it's kind of hard to see it in this. Uh, there's not a lot of contrast between the yellow gold and that, that faux scraped binding look, but uh, we'll see how it turns out after I've applied my clear coats. But it was just something I wanted to try and I thought it would, would look pretty cool. So once the dye had dried, I then proceeded with grain filling. And I'm gonna, I decided to apply grain filler to the entire body, including the top, because the top is flame maple, which means it's a mixture of face grain and end grain. And I wanna cover that up so that my clear coat finishes won't sink into the end grain. And obviously I have to fill the grain on the mahogany because mahogany has a lot of open pores that uh, cause the clear coats to shrink back into, and the texture of the grain will telegraph up through the top surface of the clear coats, and I don't want that to happen. So I had a, a decision to make what kind of grain filler to use. Now, typically I use either Crystal Lax grain filler, Aqua Coat, or my favorite is Solar Res, I can't believe it's not lacquer, grain sealer. Uh, you can just brush that on 
maybe two coats and once it's cured it's it's not going anywhere it's not going to shrink and it just it's an incredible product to use and it's it's super fast uh, once you brush it on you take it out in the sun and it cures bone dry in just a matter of of about a minute or two well the problem was is when i was ready to start applying this it was night so i and i was too anxious and my schedule was too busy and too um, clogged up with other projects that i wasn't going to have time to do the solar res during the following day. So I decided I'm gonna work through the night applying uh, grain filler, one of the water-based grain fillers. And unfortunately I was out of crystal lac, so I opted to use the aqua coat. Now the problem with the water-based grain fillers is, is you have to apply a lot of it to, to fill the grain. The stuff has a tendency to shrink as it dries and then it sinks down into the pores. So you end up having to apply coat after coat. and um, I, I find that Crystal Lax grain filler does a, a much better job of filling the grain and you can apply it fairly thin. You don't want to apply it too thick or it, it takes on kind of a white milky appearance. But if you apply it fairly thin, it does a pretty good job of filling up the grain and pores. Aqua Coat, however, I have found I've got to apply a lot of coats. So through the night, I ended up applying about four coats of the aqua coat and I really slapped the stuff on and then when it was done I let it dry and then then the following day I came back in and sanded down that rough grain filler surface to try to get it as smooth as possible without sanding through and into the underlying dyed surface so once I had that done the next step was to apply several coats of my sanding sealer. Now in the past I've used Crystal Lax sanding sealer and it works really well, but this time around I decided to try Centurion's high build sanding sealer. It's a water-based polyurethane sanding sealer. So what I ended up doing was I sprayed two coats. Now this stuff, when you pour it out of the can, it's extremely thick. It's so thick I can't use my Qual Spray mini spray gun to spray it. I have to water it down too much. I have to thin it too much um, before I can spray it. And I was kind of curious to see what would happen if I sprayed it straight from the can without thinning it. So I ended up having to use my Earlax spray gun with the largest needle that's available. And I'm using a two millimeter needle in this and I sprayed two coats about four hours apart and I could not believe how well it, it sealed the wood, it filled the grain and re, uh, resulted in a incredibly smooth surface. It was just unbelievable. I've never had a sanding sealer work that well. So what I did was I let it sit overnight and I've, I came back in and just lightly scuffed the surface with some 400 grit. So now what I'm going to do in this episode is I'm going to apply Centurion's 2K clear polyurethane finish. And this is their matte sheen, flat sheen. So I want to spray that. This, and, and this isn't going to be a high gloss finish. It's just going to be a flat matte sheen and we'll see how that works. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix this up. I'm gonna set up my portable spray booth and then I'll spray what I expect will be about three coats. And again, I'm not going to thin this like I did, um, or um, I'm gonna spray it the way I did the uh, uh, sanding sealer. I'm not gonna thin the, uh, the product. I'm going to spray it straight from the can with just the catalyst mixed into it. So again, I'm going to have to use my Earl Axe spray gun to spray this stuff because it is so thick. And I'm hoping to get away with just two or three coats and be done. So let's see what happens. All right, so after I have thoroughly mixed up the flat polyurethane, I am going to proceed with adding the catalyst. And the catalyst 
is it's a um, isocyanate based uh, catalyst. It's a water based catalyst, but nevertheless, it's an isocyanate, so I have to be careful with it in terms of the fumes. But I'm going to pour into this plastic cup the amount that I'm going to need of the polyurethane. And then what I will do is I will weigh it and we're at about looks like five ounces or just under 150 grams we'll call it uh, but 145 grams, so I will go into my calculator and multiply that by 0.1. So I need 14 and a half grams, or roughly thereabout, of the catalyst, because when I'm mixing the catalyst, I'm doing it at a 10% ratio. So I'm going to put my mask on because like I said, it's an isocyanate. Now in truth, I should be using a fresh air supplied respirator. Uh, at the moment, I don't have one of those. I just have my 3M respirator, but I don't use this product all that often, you know, maybe once or twice a month, um, or maybe once or twice a week, but not that often. So Now I can lay down each coat pretty wet because this product is so thick that I'm not really too worried about runs and drips. Plus it has the catalyst mixed in which means it's going to dry fairly quickly and the cure should start to kick off in about two to three hours. After spraying each coat, I'll hang the guitar up and let it dry for about three hours before I proceed with spraying the next coat. It's not a good idea to leave a catalyzed product like this in a spray gun for very long. So after I've sprayed a coat, I'll immediately pour the contents of the gun into a separate cup, cover that up, and then I will disassemble my spray gun and thoroughly clean it out. Now, after I've allowed the finish to dry for three to four hours, before I spray the next coat, I like to inspect the surface to make sure that there aren't any flaws that I really need to deal with now before I spray the next coat because it's just going to cause uh, problems later on. So what I'll do is I'll inspect the surface at a low angle against a bright light. And what I'm looking for are, you know, any dust particles or texture that is excessive. And if I encounter that, I'll know I need to address that with typically uh, 400 grit sandpaper. And 
I'll just lightly sand those areas to try to take care of them. I don't worry too much about getting it absolutely perfectly leveled. I just want to take down any problem areas so that when I spray the next coat, they'll disappear. Now, this all kind of ties in to the topic of how many coats do I need to apply? Back in the old days when I would spray nitrocellulose lacquer, I would put anywhere from 10 to 15 coats. And really what governed that was my confidence in my ability to level sand and polish sand before buffing so that I wouldn't sand through the finish into the underlying surface. So I felt like 10 to 15 coats was a safe bet. And I know some people who would do even more than that. And that was only because they were worried about sanding through. Well, with some of these new modern high-tech water-based polyurethane products, I think you can get away with fewer coats, but you've got to still be careful. And if you're new, you're going to probably want to spray, you know, maybe 10 to a dozen coats just to play it safe. Uh, with this product, because it's going to be drying with a flat matte sheen, I definitely don't have to spray as many coats. So really what I'm going to do in this situation is I'm going to spray each coat with the idea of trying to lay it down as a perfect coat. The more perfect the coat is, the less work I have to do later on because I'm still going to have to do a little bit of level sanding once the finish is cured. Now there were a couple of little dust spots, actually two of them here on the back, and I'm just going to address those by doing a little bit of spot sanding with some 400 grit sandpaper just to kind of clean them up before I spray the next coat. That way there's less work later on. And what I'm using here for sanding, uh, I'm using Eagle Abrasives. Uh, this is a P400 grit sandpaper, but the block I'm using is a Kovax hard rubber block and it's also sold by Eagle Abrasives and I'll put a link down in the description below so you can go check out their products. But these little hard rubber blocks with just a small piece of sandpaper wrapped around it are a really excellent way to deal with some of these little dust spots that may appear in the finish. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pour my Centurion 2K water-based clear flat finish back into my spray gun and I'm going to spray another coat just as I did before and I'll see how much better uh, it's uh, starting to appear and my goal is going to be hopefully two to three coats so this coat and maybe one more after that but I want to try to get that last coat to be as perfect as possible so that later on there's less work to do. After I sprayed the second coat, I hung up the guitar with the intention of letting it dry for about three hours in order to give it a chance to dry and to kind of kick off that cure. I then poured the contents of my spray gun back into the plastic cup, covered it up, and then thoroughly disassembled and cleaned my spray gun. I really have to emphasize it's important to do this with a 2K type product because whenever you're using a catalyzed finish, if you're not careful, it's really going to gum up the works of your spray gun. And that's going to cause issues when you try to spray your next coats. Also, the last thing you want to do is to be spraying and to see a, a tiny chunk of partially dried finish shoot out of your gun and land on the surface because that's just going to mean a lot of work later on. After I had allowed the guitar to dry and, and kick off the cure for about three hours, two to three hours, I decided to go back in and spray my third and final coat. So as I was about to pour the contents of that plastic cup back into my spray gun, I noticed that it had taken on the consistency of pancake batter. It had really thickened up. And that's just the, the pot life of a 2K product. Well, since this is a water base, I decided, let's see what happens if I 
thin it out just a little bit. So I went ahead and added just a little tiny bit of water and stir that in with a popsicle stick. And I was able to reduce the consistency from pancake batter back down to something a little closer to what it was originally in the can, which is sort of like a latex house paint. From there, I was able to spray my third and final coat. After that was done, I hung up the guitar with the intention of letting it dry and cure overnight. So at least six to eight hours. After that, it should be ready to move on to the next step. Then what I did was I uh, cleaned out my spray gun thoroughly and put it all away. The next morning, which is where we are right now, it's I think about nine o'clock in the morning here, the guitar has pretty much cured to its uh, full hardness. And as I look at the surface, you know, under a, a low angle light, it looks pretty good. In fact, I think a lot of people would be satisfied with the results and call it done. However, I can see a little bit of texture and I can see maybe one or two little minor flaws. So what I'm going to do is I am going to level sand the surface. And I'm going to start out with like a P800 grit. I may have to back down to P600, but I'm going to start at P800. And my goal is to go with the P800 and then probably the, uh, just a P1000. And from there, I should be completely finished. I should have a perfectly smooth, uh, flat matte finish that looks fantastic. And best of all, because this product is formulated to dry with a matte sheen, it shouldn't uh, have that problem of spot polishing when you rub something against it, like your forearm or the inside of a guitar case. So stick around and I'll show you the uh, final results. After close inspection of the guitar, I only found one spot that I need to address. And it's, it's where it would be covered by the bridge but I think it's just a little bit south of the bridge, so it's going to appear. And you can actually feel it as you're sanding, and it gradually dissipates until it's no longer there. You know, I'm so used to working with one part or single part polyurethanes, which are much easier to, to level sand, and typically with those I can start out with like a P800 or a P1000 grit sandpaper. But with these two part, 2K polyurethanes, the surface is so much harder. So what I've ended up doing is I am leveling with some Eagle Abrasives P400 grit, just wrapped around a little rubber eraser. And I will get the surface completely level. And after that, I will switch to the Super Aselex. Um, I'll start with the 600 grit and then I'll go to the 800 and then perhaps a thousand. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, this stuff takes a lot more elbow grease to get it level sanded because it is so hard. Okay, let me give you some tips on level sanding. I'm using the Eagle Abrasives um, P400 grit sandpaper and this is what the sandpaper looks like when you first use it. It's a sterate sandpaper. So all that white you see on there is the sterate powder. And what that does is it prevents the sandpaper from clogging up immediately as you start to sand. But as you work it, it will start to look like this. That white starts to uh, wear away. And then you'll start to get some of the finish purling up on the surface. As soon as that happens, it's time to get a fresh piece. And typically for just a section, because that's how I, I'll work is one section at a time. One of these little pieces wrapped around a rubber eraser will last about, well, it'll take about two of these little sheets to get that thoroughly level. And what I'm looking for here is as you're, as you're level sanding, even though this is a matte finish, there is still some light reflecting off the surface. And as I sand, the high spots become uh, duller than the surrounding surface, the lower spots. So you get these, when you look at it under a, a low angle bright light, you'll see light and dark areas and it's very spotty. 
yeah, it kind of represents the texture. But as you continue to, to sand with the 400 grit, you reduce those high spots until they're level with the low spots, and then the surface will have a uniform matte flat sheen. Another good trick is to set some lighting down low to the surface of the guitar so that you can check your progress. And you can do this with, you know, typical shop lighting, you know, portable shop lighting where you can position it so that you can really see your progress as you're sanding. And then as you build up sanding dust, you can grab your shop vac and vacuum it off. And then of course you wanna make sure that you clean off the sandpaper as well. And this, this sheet's starting to get clogged up, so I'm almost at the end of its life, but I will milk it for all I can. So after sanding with the 400 grit, I have a perfectly level surface, but it's covered in 400 grit sanding scratches. And most people can see those scratches with the naked eye. Of course, it all depends on the quality of your eyesight, but I can see them. So what I need to do now is remove those scratches. And I'm going to do that using a technique where I sand with progressively finer grits of sanding abrasive. And what I'll be using is the um, Super Acelix sanding abrasives. I've been talking about these a lot lately and I use them quite a bit. They're really effective um, high-tech sanding abrasives. And I'm going to start with their 600 grit and I'm using a their, their soft foam um, uh, interface pad here and that's connected to their super acelic sanding block and I'll sand the whole surface with 600 grit and then I'll move on to uh, 800 grit which is the yellow abrasive sheet and then a thousand grit which is the green one and by the time I finish with the thousand grit, the sanding scratches are so fine you can't see them with the naked eye. And at that stage, I think we're good to go. And what I'll do is I will sand in one section at a time. I kind of divide it up into quarters. And what this allows me to do is to gauge my progress because after sanding for, you know, a couple minutes here, what I can do is um, wipe off that sanding residue and then I can compare it that surface with the adjacent surface and I can see how I'm progressing and what I'm trying to do is get rid of all those scratches so it'll take a little bit of work But once I have a consistent look in this area, I can move on to this area, then this one, and then this one, the edges and such. And then I can move on to the 800 grit and the 1000 grit. And each grit takes a little bit less time. Uh, we're getting to the point where, like I said, those scratches are getting so hard to see that um, it's not as much work to remove them. They're, they're so fine. And unfortunately, due to the time constraints, I'm only going to be able to do the top and this beveled edge. I'm not going to be able to do the sides or the back. Uh, I just am going to run out of time to get this video done so that I can get it uploaded. But you'll be able to see what I'm uh, trying to achieve here. Now, if you find that going from 400 up to 600 it's taking a lot of time to get rid of those 400 grit scratches. You can resort to a more aggressive circular sanding stroke. This will remove the scratches much faster. Now some folks will say, oh, you should never use a circular sanding stroke because it leaves circular sanding scratches. That's not true, especially with this product because the sanding scratches it's leaving 
are so fine, you can't see them. And if this was going to be a high gloss finish, it would buff out beautifully without any scratches at all. But since this is going to be a, a flat matte sheen, even if you could see, or even if it did leave circular sanding scratches, you're probably not going to see them at all. All right, guys, well, that's basically the process that I follow when I apply and then detail a flat or matte or satin or semi-gloss uh, clear coat finish. It's not a whole lot different than doing a high gloss finish. You're just not having to take it to the buffing machine to bring out that last little bit of shine. So I hope you found this video to be useful. If, you know, as always, if you did, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you don't subscribe to, to Highline Guitars channel and you like to watch videos on building or repairing guitars, click that subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications. And if you'd like to show my channel some support, head over to uh, eGuitarPlans.com, links in the description below, and consider purchasing a plan for either a guitar or one of the tools that I um, make or that I use. And even if you don't, uh, make the plan that you purchase. Just know that your purchase is helping to support this channel and keeps me going. So until the next episode, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you soon.